When you tell someone you are going to brush paint a model kit, the first thing that comes to their mind is this. A streaky, brush-stroked, covered, thin-looking mess with drips and runs and sags all through it. Hardly a professional appearance at all, yet this is where most of us started out. But would you believe me if I told you that you can get professional-looking results just like this from a simple brush and a bottle of model paint? Please follow along with me in this video to see how I get results like this with off-the-shelf enamel model paints that you can buy in any hobby shop or hardware store. It's a good idea to have a range of sizes and styles for your paintbrushes. I have a collection spanning fine detail brushes up to wide brushes. You can purchase good quality brushes from hobby shops, gaming stores like Games Workshop, or art supply retail outlets. The good quality brushes will have the name of the manufacturer on them, as well as the brush sizes, which relate to the tips of the brushes. Brushes from Walmart or the dollar store may be of lower quality, but you can get a decent brush there from time to time. Sometimes these lower quality brushes will have the numbers on them so you know what sizes they are at the end, and sometimes they will not have any numbers or indications at all, so it's really up to your guess as to what sizes these are. Small brushes are good for doing detail work, while larger brushes are good for those broad areas like car bodies and hoods. Medium-sized brushes are good for those distances in between. Some brushes are made of real animal hair, while others are synthetic. Brushes made from hair are quite soft, while synthetic brushes are quite stiff. The choice of which brush to use is up to your own preferences, and I recommend experimenting until you find a brush that's right for you. It might even be good to have one of each in your collection. In this video, I want to paint this old AMT 1932 Ford Victoria to look like the 1969 Bonnie and Clyde Edition box top artwork. For this project, I will be using various enamel paint colors from a few manufacturers. Here I have paints from Testers, Floquil, Humbrol, and Tremclad. Tremclad is a rust preventative enamel that you can buy in a hardware store in various size cans and spray paints. Enamel paint is oil-based and likes to settle out or separate if it stands for a period of time. As we can see in this bottle of Tester's brass paint, the pigments have settled to the bottom, while the thinner and binders are floating on top. Before you start painting with enamel, make sure you stir up your paint with a clean stick. This ensures that the thinner binders and pigments are thoroughly mixed together. Check your mixing stick often for lumps of color pigment and keep stirring until you smooth out the lumps. Finally, put the lid back on the paint and shake it for a few minutes. This will restore the paint to its original consistency. If you are using other colors, make sure to use a clean mixing stick per paint to avoid cross-contamination of pigments. You may find that some enamel paint might be too thick right out of the jar. This can lead to brush stroke marks on the model. You want your paint to be the consistency of milk. The paint can be thinned using a ratio of one part thinner to seven parts of paint. Use a ratio of 1 to 4 if the paint is really thick.
using a ratio of one part thinner to one part of paint will give you an ideal wash for using in model car grills or any of those other areas where you need a wash. Something I learned from my time as a house painter is to never directly dip the brush into the paint bottle. Dust is your enemy. Your paint tin is your main source, and if your model or brush picks up some dust, you could end up moving that grime into the mix and onto your model. The more you use your paint, the more of it will start drying up and accumulating around the top of the lid and the surface where the lid comes in contact with the jar. Sometimes these little fragments can fall into the paint, so dipping your brush straight into there will also bring those up and put them on the model. Instead, strain the paint you want to use with the strainer into a small plastic container and dip your brush into there. Then if you do get dust into this jar, then it isn't ruining your main paint source. You can also mix your thinner ratios into here and it won't ruin the main paint source either. And from this angle I can see some bits of junk that got into the strainer that didn't go into the paint down below. Enamel paint will get you a better finish than acrylic paint as enamels take longer to dry so the paint has more time to spread on the surface and settle out. And this reduces visible brush strokes. I usually leave enamel paint to dry for 24 hours. Enamel paints cure from the top down, so although it may be dry to the touch, it may not have cured. If the paint is not fully cured, you might leave permanent fingerprints in the paint job, or any further paint coats may damage the uncured paints beneath. The paints that I am using on my model are opaque. That means that light won't pass through it and reveal the color below. However, if I use Tester's Metallics, they are translucent, and you can see through them. So what is happening with metallic paints is that because this is translucent, the light waves are passing through the color, and then they're hitting the base coat down below and are being directed back out towards our eyes. So you can see that a metal paint underneath acts as an excellent base color for the metallic paints so that that whole effect takes place. So you can see how different it looks with a silver base coat as it does with a gold base coat or a copper or any of those other kind of bronzy brass metallics. Here's what metallic green looks like sprayed over a gold base coat. You can really see that metal flake come alive. Most of the time, model car kits are molded in a nice neutral plastic color that is really friendly to your paints, like this white or light gray. Some other colors include light tan and duck egg blue. Sometimes the model kits will be molded in a non-paint friendly color, like red, yellow, or even this black. And why they're not paint friendly is because if you don't want a red 57 Chevy, for example, and you want this to be white, and you just paint right over top of the red plastic with white, the red plastic will bleed through into the white paint and will turn your Chevy pink. So in order to prevent that from happening, what you need is a coat of primer paint that's going to act as a block between the red plastic and the white color paint that you're going to put on the top. The same sort of thing can happen with black colored plastic and even the yellow. And some of the other colors that are not friendly are dark blues and other dark colors. So really you have two choices here. One is to paint the model in the color that it's molded in, so other reds. Or the other choice, of course, is to use primer and paint over the whole thing and then paint the color that you want. Paint has a natural tendency to draw away from sharp edges. Therefore, before you begin painting, make sure you remove seam lines, parting lines, and sand down or file flat glue joints before painting. A little preparation goes a long way. You also want to sand the surface of your model car body with fine sandpaper of 600, 800, and 1000 grit before you paint to provide a tooth for the paint to attach to the model. The goal is to dull down the molded sheen of the model surface without sanding off any of the small details.
something like this should be the result. Now obviously you won't be able to sandpaper down any of these smaller parts, but as long as they are nice and clean, the paint will still stick onto them. The sanding tooth just adds extra grip to the paint on the bigger surfaces, such as like our body, our fenders, and our hood, or whatever else you have if you're building a different car. Once you have removed the sharp edges, you will need to clean your model parts. Use a mild solution of dish soap, vinegar, and water. Wash the parts thoroughly before painting them to remove any mold release agent that may have been used in manufacturing, body oil from your hands, sanding residue, and dust which is naturally attracted to plastic by static electricity. I use a toothbrush here just to get into the cracks. And then for the small parts, like on that parts tree, you can just rock them back and forth till they get nice and clean. And then you'd also need to rinse them off and uh, let them air dry. Let the parts air dry or use a towel to dry them, but do not use paper towel, tissues, or toilet paper since they will leave lint on the parts. Once the parts have air dried and if you notice any other dust on the model, you can remove it with a tack rag by just rubbing it on the surface or you can also use something like this dust blaster to blow the dust off of the model and off of your brush ends as well. Small parts can be easily painted if they are mounted on a wooden stick, held in a clamp, or stuck on a box with some tape. You can make an effective handle for painting a model car by mounting it on a box or even a soda can. It all really depends on the inner dimensions and how the model sits on each item. I don't recommend painting parts on the parts trees because of the seam lines on the kit that you'd have to clean up. And then once the parts are painted, you also will have to cut them off the parts trees. And that leaves a little nib sticking out, which you will have to then file. So while you're doing all this, you've got your painted parts and your filing and everything, you're actually working the paint off with your fingers. My dad had fingerprints like sandpaper, and they definitely wore the paint right down to the plastic. So I highly recommend not doing that. It's a lot better just to clean up the parts ahead of time, then paint them all as a unit, then pull them off of the taped box or the, the uh, stick or whatever you mounted these on, then deal with the parts then. You also want to pay close attention to the color callouts in the instructions to know which parts are painted as a unit and which parts are painted individually. It is easier to build some of the sub-assemblies first and then paint the item as a unit instead of painting each individual part and then gluing them together. Paint should be applied evenly in several thin coats instead of one heavy coat. Three coats is the norm. Use your widest brush to reduce the amount of brush strokes that you'll see in the final product. I was trained to paint a car as if it had been rained on. Start with all the top surfaces like the roof, the hood, the cowl, and the trunk, and then move to the side panels and the front end. Engine bays, firewalls, underneath the hood, and the fender wells can be painted either before or after the top coats. Other small parts to paint, like the engine, the chassis, and the suspension, can be built in sub-assemblies, as I've done here, which are easily taken apart so that you can paint them separately and then glue them all back together later. One thing I did with the engine is I drilled a little hole in the transmission right here so that I could put a stick in the end, which acts as a nice little support for the engine while I'm painting it. Remember to finish off any bodywork that may be needed before you begin painting these parts. Try and brush in the same direction for each coat. So starting with the roof, Try to make long brush strokes going from one end to the other. And remember, we're going to be using three coats of paint. And as you can see, this is testers paint that's been strained. And it is going on quite nice. 
I'll just check here and I don't see any little bits of dust or junk. Which is good. Now if you're going on these edges, of course, remember to taper them out. Try to get into your window frames. And roll it into one direction again. That should take care of the roof. Now moving along the body, do the same thing, go in long areas. See here I'm getting a drip around that wheel arch, so we'll just pull the paint back this way, just to take care of that. And up around in here. Remember you're always going to be turning the stand so you can see where you're heading with the brush. Now if you put paint in the middle like I did, remember to pull it out evenly to each end. You don't really want to uh, do what I'm doing right now, just going in like that. As a uh, stopping point, you still want to take this all the way back in one long stroke. Just like you would if you were spray painting. Now we can go across the back, like so. Now again, you do have time for the enamel to dry, since it is oil-based. So there's plenty of time to catch any runs or drips that might be happening, and to make this model look perfect. Try to get the paint into the door cracks. And let's go up into the window frames. And gently bring this back out. Starting to get a run in that wheel well. So bring it out again. How's it looking on that side? Getting some drips down here. So just carefully get rid of them. Just like so. Nice long brush strokes. Let's go across the cowl. Up to that window post. And we're almost done for the body. and then rotate this around so you can make sure that you get all those spots in the window openings. That there's no white plastic or white primer or any other colors in there. And just taper this out one more time. 
There we go. Now up along the edge of the firewall. Firewall is going to be gloss black. I did the research on that. So it doesn't matter if you get a little bit of the red paint on it because you'll come in and block it out with your paintbrush up around this area here with the flat black or gloss black, sorry. Semi-gloss black? I don't know. Black paint of some description. So we'll get in here. Now you may notice that when you put the body on the fenders, there might be some blank areas inside the body that you're going to see up through the bottom of the fenders in the back. So don't worry about that too much for now. Once this color has dried, uh, all three coats of this color has dried, you can go in and paint that inner spot with the gloss or flat black or red even, whichever color you need and uh, just hide that. Okay, so how does this look? Just turn it around a few times. Try to catch a light, see if there's any sags or runs. I don't see any dust on this. There are some weird spots in here because this was a model kit I got from somebody else. And originally it was metallic blue and built up as a hot rod and I stripped it down to make it stock. So after a few coats of paint, I'm hoping those will disappear. But what I really should have done is painted the whole thing with primer and then did the brush painting on top. But this is a rough body and I also want to try to do some maybe damage on it like Bonnie and Clyde would have, which I should have done before painting it. But I do want to get this painting video on the go. Next up, I have my hood, and again, same technique. Gonna start from the top and work our way down the sides. This is Tester's 1104 Red, which is their dark red. 1103 is light red. And here I actually have the part hooked up to a clamp, and it's stuck on a popsicle stick, a haagen popsicle stick, but that doesn't really matter. So we're gonna start a little back from the edge and just apply the paint down here on the top surfaces, like so. Then we're gonna stretch it to the ends and come right off the model. So into the back and along here. And you see, I can almost paint a two-tone down here with a different color if I wanted to, but in this case, I'm going for that classic look like the Bonnie and Clyde car and we're just going to go down the sides. Now here you have louvers, which are going to be hard to paint if you're going this way, because the paint is not really going to go in the louvers correctly. So to begin with, we can pull the brush downward into the louvers, which is the correct way they want to be painted, because these are vertical, not horizontal. Now we can move the brush horizontal along the edges, just like so, up into here, and down. And again, go along the bottom edges, and if you can, into these edges. Now the issue is when you go into an edge like this, you can bring paint up along the top edge as a drip along here. So you really need to more or less dry brush this, so that's to have as little paint in the brush bristles as you can, and go along the top, and carefully along where this tape is. And now we'll do these louvers. Now this is opposite hand to the other side. So not going to be able to go from the edge, but I can go this way. Bring it out here and along here. I'll go up and down. 
and one across like this. See, if I go this way, you tend to get little bubbles into those louvers. So you got to be careful that all those bubbles are gone, or else you could run into some issues there. Okay, and then here we are. And then on this end, How's that looking? Now the first coat will look a little transparent in spots, but then subsequent coats going on the top will thicken it up. And according to my light, this is looking pretty good. Could use a little bit down here. And there we have the hood. And the last piece to be painted red is our radiator shroud. And there is one other little thing I should mention. You don't want to ever get paint into this metal part up where the bristles attach because it gets very hard to clean and that paint will always be up in there when you go to paint your next model and could come out into the next color of paint. So just try to make sure you hit the brush bristles on the end as you're painting and try not to let it get up into the metal. Okay, so here we can actually start inside the radiator and pull outward. I guess I should say inside the shroud. Do you know what I mean? So we'll pull upward and outward to get to the outer edge from this inner edge just like so. Remember that the actual inside of the radiator is going to be flat black right there, and that will cover any red you get into the corners. Okay, so here we are, moving our way outward with the paintbrush. And it's a little bit hard in these bottom corners down here. But there we are. And try not to let the paint pool up in here either. You know, like at a swimming pool where all the water goes to one end. Okay, now we can go on the sides of the shroud, shroud pardon me, and we're pulling upward and using long strokes. And we can now go down and meet the stroke down below. Bring this side out this way. that front area and be careful not to load too much paint into the Ford logo because that's going to be detail painted with the actual white and blue so if it's too full you're gonna lose the lettering and there we are so now we can go up around and from here Pull downward. And catch up on the bottom. Sort of makes me think of a shroud from a World War I aircraft. Now, on the back side, I'll just use the tip of the brush here. And carefully go around here. And down. Now part of this is underneath the tape, so when I go to paint this with a flat black, of course the tape is going to be removed at that point. And then I'll be able to hold the radiator from the sides carefully and paint the inside. So just using the tip bristles of the brush and bringing it out here. Okay, won't get too much into this area because again, this is actually right where I'm painting now is a little piece of like rope or a rubber seal and that's to keep the hood sides off of nicking the paint on the radiator. So again, looks really good. 
very easy, very simple to use the brush and will look even better after the three coats of paint are applied. Here we have the fenders for the car and what I've done is I've taken one of my powerful spring clamps and I've clipped it onto this little beam right here that's sticking up off the floorboards and it's very secure so what I can do here is paint the underneath and then turn it over and paint the top surfaces. So let's try to do that. Now what I have is that trim clad gloss paint and I did thin this one down with a mixture of four to one because it is thicker. So now you can see how nicely this is starting to go. Now what I will do here is I'll paint this curve sort of separately from this longer run in sugar scoop curve. That's just to make things a bit simpler on myself and to avoid having a bit of a paint pile up here on the edges. Maybe I did thin this a little bit too much, but that's okay. Now here you can see what I was saying before with the paint pulling away from those higher ridges right on there. It does look a little bit whiter. I don't know how well you can see that, but if you were to paint, you would see it. So those will eventually get covered over with a couple of coats of paint. But for now, they will pull through. So try not to worry about that. Remember, we want a few nice, thin, even coats as opposed to one big, thick, runny coat. So this will make your model look quite nice. So here we go with painting. Now, because this is an under surface, there's going to be a lot of little weird areas that are sticking up where your brush is going to go into them. So you sort of want to jab your brush into them, you know, in a nice way, and then make sure you pull that as one big even thing afterwards. Okay, so we are almost got that one side done. So now I'm starting in the middle of that curve pulling upward and outward to meet it on the fenders and then going in the reverse just to catch it onto the back end of the car. Then one big curve. And there we are. So again, you can see just how easy this really is. No big major skill in it. Uh, it's much like spray painting, only you're more in control here because you do have control of the brush. And then just go across and pull into the middle on both sides and then carefully bring it out. I could also go this way, might even be better. Yeah, that turned out a bit better. this way, get that inner panel, running board panel, and much like the louvers you want to try to get the paint into those brackets so we're gonna pull it out this way and then run across this way just to get those end bits of the bracket Get up around where the horn mounts in. There's a bit of a tube there, the tube where the headlights are going to go in. Okay, and then we'll go to the front of the car, pull this area back halfway in the middle of the fender arch. Uh, can turn this way now, go downward. Now let's get into that inner section of the fuel tank area. Just like so, and try to get paint onto that clip.
Now because I added more thinner into this area, it will take a bit longer to dry. But the brush stroke should pull all out of it because it has that uh, extra thinness in the paint to move in either direction before it completely sets up. So now we've got to make sure we get all these braces in here. And up underneath. We will be able to see this better when we turn it over. Get this brace here. And over to the end. We'll get the bottom braces here. And along the bottom of the gas tank on that edge. Okay, and I think we're ready to turn this over. Now where the clamp is, we're going to have to paint that afterwards, of course, because the clamp is in the way. So now we're starting to see a little bit of run right here. So I might have got a bit of paint over the edge when I was painting the insides. Uh, this will be interesting for the camera to hold. Okay, let's go out here. I'm going to try to keep back off the rubber on the running boards. And what I'll do later, once this dries, is I will paint inside the running boards with a semi-gloss or flat black to represent the rubber that these things are made out of. Okay, I can see that this paint is thinner because it's more transparent looking in the black. But here you can see I've already got this far in a short period of time. Now if I had this as a spray paint job, this would be a lot quicker, but you can see we can get the same kind of results just going this way with the thin down black paint. Again, this is looking really nice. So I'll come up here on the scoops and long strokes, go up the catwalk here. Pull this all down and one big long brush stroke up to the front. Okay, now this is where it gets a little bit challenging for my hand here because I don't want to put the car into the bottom of the table. So we're going to go into that edge right where the fender meets the running board. Paint there and paint there. Now let's connect this area here. Nice and gentle, just like that. And then turn the fenders this way. Try not to catch a clip in the paint pot. And we're going to pull this upward first. Okay, just to get it in there, get the paint in there. Then go from where that curves. Actually, it'd be better to go from the almost 90 degree angle here, pull it out into the more subtle curve up at the front, like so. You can see how nice this is actually settling out right after painting. There is zero dust and zero brush strokes, so it does pay to strain this and then to thin it. Um, now, <laughs> how am I getting these? See, if I wasn't filming, I could actually stand up more and maneuver this out, you know, into the open where I'm standing, just to make sure that uh, I'm not hitting anything or about to hit something because the last thing I really want to do is get my fresh paint and hit this bottom down here you know just from turning the model but overall this is nice okay get around that fuel cap 
little spout that's sticking up. And up in those frame horns where the uh, fender is, or sorry, the bumper is going to mount. Gas tank, uh, cap on the tank. And here's how the fenders look after the first coat, and you can see just how smooth this is. There are no brush strokes at all, and that's just from thinning down the trim clad into a usable state, and boy does it ever look good. Each coat should be allowed to dry before wet sanding with 1200 grade sandpaper. Sand between all coats except for the last coat. Be careful not to remove any detail while sanding. Here's our fenders after I wet sanded with the 1200 grade sandpaper and you will notice some areas that did get sanded through right down to the bare plastic again but that's okay because our next coat of gloss black paint will cover that over. The important part is that I was able to sand out any dust and imperfections from the first coat of paint and that will help the second coat of paint lay over top of this smoothly as well as providing that tooth that we needed in order to lock it all in place. Here we have our fenders after the second coat of paint and look at that wonderful shine on there. Totally smooth, no brush strokes. You can even see the reflection from the light. Again, really awesome work and really easy to do. Here's our body all ready for the second coat of paint and I did sand it with 1200 grade sandpaper just to add another tooth onto the body. One thing that did happen is I started to cut through here down to the white underneath. So before I paint this I will go in with a small brush and just touch up these edges so that when the second coat comes in here it can blend in and it won't actually highlight all these areas that have the white primer. Now originally this model kit was painted by somebody else and I did try to strip the paint off underneath but there was a lot of body damage and all sorts of things so I did add a bit of putty just to clean it up. However, I am experiencing some issues with the body. In contrast, the hood and the radiator shroud come from the AMT 1932 Ford Fiaton kit made by RC2. Now the issue was that the original RC2 kit came with the Vicky interior instead of the Fiaton interior. So I did end up swapping the body with the Vicky one that I got from a friend of mine. Now when it comes to touching up small details like this or even detail painting on dashboards or whatever, a good way to steady your hand is to take your non-dominant hand and put it palm up like this and then with your dominant hand that's going to actually do the painting, put it into your palm and then lock your hand in so that you are braced properly in order to paint these small details instead of trying to go freehand and basically being out of control. So control is the key and this is the best way I found in order to do it. And make sure the part you're painting is secure to the table so it won't move out of the way. Here we have the Vicky body after doing the touch-ups and you can hardly even tell where I cut through. Like, for example, on this hinge, it's as solid as the rest of the car. Again, really looks good and you can't tell. Now, one area that I did leave undone is in these fender arches because I do believe I'm going to be painting those gloss black in order to hide them from the fenders when you're looking through on the sides. This time around when I paint, I'm going to change the direction of the brush so that the brush strokes are hidden on the model when we get into our third coat of paint. Now instead of going across this way like I did originally, I'm going to go up and down this way, which is the opposite direction of the way I went originally. And again, that is to check to see if I can get rid of brush strokes and maybe some of the irregularities from going long. Here we have the hood with the second coat of paint. And I went this way across the top of the hood instead of the long way as I did with the first coat. And you can see just how much darker and more filled out this is looking. 
One thing about enamel paint is when they dry, they will start to suck into the detail. So that is always a good thing to keep in mind. If you think you've gone a little bit too thick, it will resolve itself a little later on when it dries. Here we have the Vicky body after the second coat of paint. And you can see that it is starting to darken out a bit and not look as transparent as the first coat. So again, this is the way we want it for coat number two. And soon we can begin the third coat. Here we have the body after sanding down the second coat and there still are a few little areas that did get sanded through again right back down to that white primer. But they are a lot smaller in area as to what we had on the first coat. So with a little bit of touch up on these spots we should have this all nice and fixed up. For the final coat of paint I'm going to add two drops of thinner to our testers 1104 gloss red. This is done in order to make the paint flow more easily and to further reduce brush stroke marks on the finished model. For the final coat my brush strokes will go horizontal and that is to again bring those long strokes into the model. And here we have the model after applying the third coat of paint and as you can see it now looks thick and looks the way this red should appear from the sides of the bottle. So again, some amazing work when you can get three coats of paint on your model and make it look really nice. Now while we're waiting for the third coat of paint to dry, I thought I would show you my progress on the Flathead Ford V8. This is actually painted to match the original 1932 Ford Flathead from the Henry Ford Museum. And I never knew this before because when we were doing research back in the 80s, it would just say in the instructions, paint the engine green. And of course, if you never knew anyone that had this car, how would you know that the entire oil pan right up underneath the transmission, actually the flywheel right there, was aluminum? I would have never known that. Also, the front distributor here is aluminum right up the middle and it has these black caps on it, as well as an aluminum wire to hold the caps on which I have to paint a little later. But yeah, that was the issue with back in the 80s. And unless you could find a good book on it somewhere in the library before the internet, you would never know that the starter motor was gloss black. Well, maybe you would, but that the exhaust manifolds were silver. And I've also found some issues with this engine compared to the one in the Ford Museum. So there's supposed to be another unit right behind this rod up here. And that is a little fuel pump to pump into the carburetor and the little tubes off the distributor are missing they're supposed to go up and over and then the wires come off onto the spark plugs on each side and then of course all the stud bolts being painted in so here's an image of the actual Ford motor pardon me from the Henry Ford Museum I also have our frame and chassis here, which we will end up painting with the semi-gloss black. But what I wanted to show you is AMT has two holes right here, and that is for the hot rod exhaust pipe. But if you are building this model stock, that hole would be filled in. So I've done that with the little white dot of putty here. I also found some sink marks along the frame rails, which I filled first with Tamiya gray spot putty, and then with the white after I sanded the gray down and you can more or less see it right in here and a little bit on top because there's two sink marks right there and there. So this is all the bodywork that I'm doing for this chassis before I paint it. And once we get a coat of paint on it, all that putty and detail work will be gone. Here we have the chassis after adding a coat of semi-gloss black and you can see the little hole that I filled has been completely covered over by the paint and looks terrific, just like factory stock. These side frame rails are nice and smooth as well. And overall, the color is quite well covered. And here I've left this wide open so that I can glue the floorboards of the running boards into here. And the engine bay is completely painted. So once the engine gets dropped in, it should look factory correct. Here we have the grill with a mixture of 50% tester satin black and thinner. You can see how well it flowed between the chrome bars.
Here we have our wonderful chassis after a few hours of painting and model building, and you can see how all the colors combine and play off each other as well. So what we have is satin black for the chassis, as well as gloss black on the fenders, the rear axle and the front axle, as well as the starter motor down below. We have yellow for the wheels and a red radiator. So after a few hours of working, I hope that your projects come out as nice as this. When painting a two-tone body, the lightest color should be painted first. Here's an example of what happens if you have a darker color underneath a lighter color. The darker color will bleed through and you will be able to see it. Use masking tape to cover the area you do not want to have painted. You can also burnish down the edges with a burnishing tool like the one I made here, just by using a metal rod hammering down the edge and then buffing out the back end. I use frog tape for its ease of removal and lack of residue. With the way we masked the hood, it will be difficult to paint away from the masking tape edge. Sadly, this issue is unavoidable. After the second color is dried to the touch, you can remove the tape by gently pulling it off at an angle away from the painted area. This prevents edge damage that you would get from pulling the tape straight upward. Paint away from the masking tape to stop the paint building up against it and leaving a ridge when you remove the tape. You can also try freehanding in some sections. For example, I am going to paint this stripe here with the tape, but when it comes to this curve that's up in here, I will take my brush and just follow it along, as well as following it along here without the use of any masking tape. I will also freehand the firewall once I remove the masking tape from the two-tone paint job. Here we have the body after removing the masking tape and you can see how well it worked up around on the cowl here with the freehand painting as well as in the wheel arch and at the front on the firewall. Now this car looks a little less like the Bonnie and Clyde model and more like this illustration right here. Now I've almost finished my model kit. The only things I need to do is paint the inside of the body with the interior color and then paint the interior, the seats, the dashboard, and the steering wheel, assemble all those parts, and then install my glass and that interior in here. And the other thing is to paint this panel on the roof with a flat black, just like the real car. Now, before I put the body on this car, I thought I would show you this cool figure that I have. He's from an MPC originally, but then later AMT, 1932 Chrysler Imperial kit, and this was one of the old Gangbusters series kits that had the Mafia guys in it, or the gangsters, whatever you want to call them. Now, I've decided not to turn him into a gangster. I thought what I would do is make him into a road traveler. So inside the car, there is some luggage and some road maps on the front seat, which have also fallen onto the floor a little bit. And I thought this would add a little visual interest into the kit. So I decided to make this man a traveler from Georgia and I got the license plate from the AMT 1932 Ford Vicky Phantom model kit that came out a long time ago. And then for some of the places that he's traveled, this matches the suitcase luggage as well. We have Illinois. We also have two from Texas. We've got Missouri. I'm not sure where this one is from. And this is a Route 66 decal. And I put them on this side of the fender because I figured they would have been blocked if I put them there where the license plate is. Now I still have to add the taillight in, but I did use Molotol Chrome paint on here. That's an alcohol-based paint and it will work the same way as the enamel. The only difference is you have to clean it up with rubbing alcohol. You'll also notice there is no spare tire on here. That is still being painted, so it will come up at the end of the video. Here we have the traveler's luggage in the back seat of the Victoria. And what you can see is all the little places that he's visited in his many travels around the United States. Now this bit of luggage actually came from the 1932 Chrysler kit as well. Someone had given me this and they glued it shut. This is the bag that contains the money for the mobsters. But uh, now that it's all glued shut, you can't see it. So I used Citadel acrylic paints to paint all the detail on there for the leather. 
I know it's not uh, testers, that's a different lesson altogether, but still you can see how well this all turned out. Now always remember to paint your upper and inner surfaces of the interiors of your car, and that is so if someone looks through the window they will see what should naturally be there. Here we have the tan on the rooftop, as well as the black around the base. It is very important to look after your brushes. These are brushes that my father-in-law owned, and he never even cleaned any of these. So this is what you are left with if you don't clean your brushes. Basically things that you have to either throw away, or there is a way to save these. You can put them in lacquer thinner and soak them and work them, and eventually they will be clean. But listen to this. You can hear the paint crushing into the bristles. Here we have an example of two identical paintbrushes. However, this one has been taken care of over its life, and this one has not. It takes a short time before the new paintbrush can be brought to its maximum efficiency and properly cared for, it can last for years. However, a paintbrush that is not properly cared for will really only last for that one paint job. Brushes that are used for finishing must be absolutely clean, and this is a condition that can be acquired and maintained only by use and care. These brushes improve in value and usefulness in direct proportion to the care and use given them. For cleaning a brush after using enamel paint, I will rinse it in a separate container of paint thinner until all the color is out, briefly wiping the bristles onto an old rag until it looks clean again. Since paint thinner is designed to only dilute enamel paint, I usually find that even a clean looking brush usually has some remaining color residue that may reactivate in your next color of paint. As an extra measure, I will rinse the bristles in water and add soap to the bristles. Then I will moil the soap into the bristles and work it until all the color comes out with the soap. After this, I form the bristles back to their original shape and let them air dry. See the color coming out with the soap? And then to rinse. and form the point. Always remember to clean your brush completely before changing colors because one color will alter the other. Here's the moment you've all been waiting for, the look at our 1932 Ford Victoria. And here you can see just how well the brush painting worked. Take a look at the reflections here on the front fenders and up above. You can see just how perfectly circular they are as I rotate the car around on the turntable. I had to put the chocks in the back because this was rolling out of the way every time I turned this. But overall, I mean, this looks really good. You can see the reflection of the tire in the back on the paint. And there's our license plates and travel stickers. Now, the uh, decals really fit well on the glossy paint job. You can even see the blue that I painted into the hubcaps there. Again, excellent work. A little bit hard to see the driver in here. Let's just call him Chuck. Chuck from Georgia. Some of you may know who that is. <laughs> I couldn't paint the Ford logo with the lettering. I think my eyes are starting to go for that sort of deal. And I'm hoping that maybe Ravel or AMT comes up with a decal for it in the future that I can just slip it in, much like I did on my Citroen. And take a look at that nice gloss right there. See how it's perfect oval and up into the window. Again, really excellent work with a paintbrush. And this is what you can do if you use my technique. <laughs> 